Good morning, everyone, or on YouTube later, whatever time of day you're watching this. Um, today we're going to finish up Nozick and get started with Rawls. Um, and I, oh, uh, we got a question here. A bit confused on how to turn in the Rawls reading comments. Should I just send you an email? I should have actually um, made that into a submission. Uh, does the are the Rawls reading comments not showing up as having um, a upload option? Here, let me. I'm gonna pause the video and just fix this right now. So I just double check that, and yeah, there there is a there is a submission spot there. So it's just like when you uh, put in a journal entry, uh, just like that for reading comments from here on out. Yeah. Cool. Yep. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, all right. So uh, before I, before I get started on all that though, uh, the content for today's uh, discussion, um, <clears throat> I did. So I was recording feedback videos for my 101 student papers last night and while I was uploading them on YouTube <clears throat> I just saw the uh, YouTube I mean I guess it's been around for a little while but I hadn't ever really noticed it um, the analytics tab so I just was like oh, I'm gonna take a look at the analytics on the on the videos I've been submitting this week and I noticed a pattern um, <clears throat> and I just wanted to make some kind of comment about it so what I saw is YouTube lets you track how people are watching your videos and when people are watching which portions of your videos and it looked like this so some people are watching my videos all the way through um, but they they sort of uh, it, people start watching it and then they stop watching it very a few minutes after there well, there's a significant number of these and then not watching the whole video and then there's a little spike where I put the code word um, and whether it was right at the end, that's where the spike is, or if it was a little bit before the end, that's where the spike was. So what that tells me is that people are not watching the whole video and getting the whole lecture and just getting the code word to be able to put into the assignment to get the attendance credit and not actually watching it, which is uh, not the intention <laughs> for these. Um, and... Uh, I don't want to have to go into some mode where I do present a more substantive quiz that would require you to actually watch the video in order to prove that you did it. This is kind of me, the setting up the system is kind of an honor system thing and it looks like there's some abuse to that honor system that's happening. So I just wanted to say that's not the intention, <laughs> please don't do that and uh, please don't force my hand on doing something um, that is going to be probably more obnoxious to everybody. So, and, and some people in the chat are saying, uh, are seconding that sentiment. So, um, for all of you who are right now live with me, uh, this does not apply to you, of course. Um, but for those of you watching this on YouTube later, um, please, please don't abuse the system. I, the whole point of this is to get you access to education. And if the format is not doing that, then we're kind of not doing I mean I guess I'm still providing the opportunity for those people who were not going to be on campus so that opportunity is preserved but in terms of the substance of what we're trying to do here it's not happening so um, yeah don't don't want that <laughs> okay so um, thank you Shaoki for seconding me on that um, yeah uh, okay let's get started with the content though um, okie dokes um, or maybe Shauki, you were like, please don't make it into a substantive quiz. Maybe that's what you were responding to. But um, yes, as a request to all the students in the class, please, please watch these. Um, I, I'm not going to switch right now into doing a more substantive quiz as a response to the scenario. I'm just going to, again, in the spirit of goodwill, make a request uh, to, to honor um, this format uh, with sincerity. I know you're busy, but this is this class is one of the things you're busy with, and you know I'm very accommodating and flexible with you balancing all the other stuff that's going on with other classes and life and all that kind of thing. But please don't sacrifice um, your opportunity to engage with this class. Um, the material we're doing right now, I'll just say, like personally, I think this is like super crucial stuff, um, and part of the reason why, uh, yeah, I'll go on a little tangent here. Get on a little soapbox. Step up on my soapbox. Um, <clears throat> I I think this material that we're doing right now 
is a testament to why political philosophy is an important piece of the puzzle, even if you're really focused on or have ambitions with just changing how society is actually going. So if you're sort of like an activist mentality, something like um, uh, wanting to see some policy changes on some particular issue, understanding the potentially legitimate arguments or reasons why people are going to be opposed to that um, or have some disagreement about it is, is really, really important. It helps facilitate understanding and dialogue that can actually be productive. Um, the, this is what I see time and time again when I teach my um, business ethics class, because this, this unit with Rawls and Nozick and Cohen is actually imported straight over from my business ethics class. It's one of the few times I've, I've done that with this class, because there is so much overlap in terms of the territory um, between those two classes. They're both so much about social justice. But um, I, every so it's just a little report. Every time I teach business ethics, I've been doing this for like six years now. This class is new, but that class I've been doing for a while. And I always see at the beginning of the quarter, people really like fighting like cats and dogs over issues that are related to what sort of the Rawls Nozick debate is happen has happening in it. And then when we actually get in, and the, the discussion debate isn't always super productive. You know, people have different background assumptions that they're starting with, and they don't see eye to eye, and they talk past each other, and blah, 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 blah. Um, but uh, the once we actually get to some of the underlying arguments or the moral values that are being appealed to to justify one way of organizing this uh, system of cooperation that is society versus another, then I see my students oftentimes not just being able to figure out how there is a reasonable disagreement, but being able to engage productively with each other too in those conversations and exploring that. Um, I also think sometimes especially things like the liberal tradition of political philosophy, um, get criticized on some of the details without understanding um, the underlying uh, theoretical and argumentative motivations for those things. And those have to be engaged with. If you want to, so we were talking a little bit before class got started. If you don't like Nozick, um, that's fine. That's fair. If you don't like Rawls or Cohen, um, communism, is, Marxism is what Cohen's going to be defending. You might not like that. Um, but being able to understand it, uh, and understand how people can be rationally drawn into it, that, that it isn't just the function of biases, uh, like cultural biases or rationalizations or something like that. Very, very helpful, I think. Um, I think it's, I think understanding some of this theoretical material is part of being, is having the kind of information necessary to be able to perform civic functions like voting in a democracy and being a part of democratic discourse uh, in a in a uh, substantive, meaningful way. So that's a little bit of my little... I should have probably turned my hat for that one. Um, <laughs> that's a little uh, advocacy for the, the value of this curriculum. Um, and if you want to debate that more, we could do that. Mark ha or Anthony has a... Um, Mark Anthony. <laughs> uh, Anthony has a um, suggestion about embedding the code word halfway through the lecture and just keep going. Yeah, I'm thinking about that. Um <clears throat> Uh, I think I, I know students are clever and tech savvy and at this point YouTube uh, maybe I shouldn't be advertising this but YouTube has the ability to generate a tr transcript automatically for videos now and so as soon as I upload the video after a few minutes or a little bit of time YouTube has its automatic captions generated and you can just do a search for my words for code word and probably find what part of the video it's in and then watch that and make sure you heard it right, which is what I think people are doing. Because uh, I did, one of the videos was, the code word was a little bit earlier, <clears throat> and that's where I saw the spike in in viewership. Um, the other question, why why do I record outside? Because uh, my kid's in there, and you don't want my kid running around while I'm doing a video lecture. Uh, he likes to climb on me and yelling and stuff like that, and I didn't want to be have that distraction present for all of you. Um, looks like there's another comment coming in. Um, mm -hmm. Here, maybe while <clears throat> people are typing, I'm going to keep talking here. So just kind of bringing it back uh, uh, up to speed from what we did yesterday. We were talking about the Lockean proviso um, that Nozick brings up. Um, <laughs> oh, that's a really interesting idea. Mm, I like that idea, Anthony. Hmm, I might do that. I might do that. But, I mean, 
<laughs> so I just like pause the video or just silent for a little while. I'm going this kind of thing. I might be able to do that. Uh, do it as a visual. Yeah, it's interesting. Hmm. I'll have to think about that. I just don't. I don't like getting into this game. I'd rather just appeal to people, people's goodwill, <laughs> just like do this for reals, rather than trying to find some way to game it and out game it. Um, anyway, okay. So we are talking about the Lockean and Proviso, and this is about justice and acquisition. So how do things go from being unowned to being owned in a just way? We're not presuming anything about some uh, extra conventional sense of property and uh, a moral right to property here. Um, we're thinking about what framework would give legitimate status to property. And part of the reason for this, and this will be an important idea for Rawls too, as we mentioned before, property rights require social cooperation. So the question is what kind of system of so social cooperation that's then going to generate a space for people having legitimate power over certain property is going to be a just arrangement for everybody. So it's not just about the person who has the property ownership, but everyone else who has to respect it. Remember the idea about how rights and obligations are two sides of the same coin. So we, we had this idea from Locke about how mixing my labor or my effort or energy with something investing in it and developing it is how I lay claim to to acquisition, moral, moral acquisition. And someone put in a comment, I think, uh, in a reading comment or, or something that popped up, and I don't think I addressed it yet, but I was planning to, about um, wouldn't you only be entitled to the added value, whatever you're creating, because you have control over your own body. You know, we're going to give that kind of autonomy right to people. <clears throat> so when I mix my labor with something, and improve it, maybe I don't lay claim to the whole thing, but just to whatever is my added value. Nozick has a reply for this in the reading. He says, yeah, well, any system that we're actually going to design for how society's going to go that's only going to talk about the extra value is not going to be able to work as a system. So it's it's just a matter of practical convention that we're, we're not going to try to play that game with it. It would be too complicated and, and difficult to figure out like what exactly is the added value and what does that confer on me in terms of property rights with regard to that thing that I invested in, that kind of stuff. Um, so so this, is a, this is a concern. But in, in many ways, it's, um, it's not going to matter um, practically now uh, for one really big reason that we're going to get into, which is that most things are not unowned anymore. Most of the world has been kind of carved up with property ownership. Not all of it. And there are some interesting metaphysical spaces that have not been sort of um, laid claim to, the like frontier of unowned things. And that is the area of intellectual property. That is also kind of like, you can imagine it like land, right? There's all this like empty land. No one, No one's living on it. No one owns it. And then people go and like settle in it and then take take ownership of it. Um, that's not really a, a super realistic example. Think about the history of the world and civilizations. People have been everywhere. I mean, the the evolution of, of Homo sapiens, and they've populated everywhere before societies got created. But if you imagine um, that this kind of hypothetical, like maybe colonizing Mars or something, right? There's no one living on there. People go there. They invest their labor, they invest in, in Mars, and then end up getting property rights over the land there. You can imagine the space of intellectual ideas as kind of like this too. It's like unexplored territory or unclaimed territory, and then people have ideas and then they lay claim to them. So we'll talk about intellectual property rights um, as we keep going here. But um, <clears throat> we got uh, I gave you the little goofy scenario about the orchard. Uh, trees and our little village that we live in and people investing in those trees improving their fruit and then laying claim to them and the paradox that emerges here because Locke puts in this important proviso to the general pattern of how you mix your labor with something and then lay claim to ownership of it. He's saying when we make that transition as a society that we recognize okay now this thing that was unowned you now own it. That has to in order for that to be just Locke says, granting that property right to the person can't worsen the situation of others. So we talked about how there could be advantages for wanting to give these property rights to people in society. 
um, because it's going to increase people's options. It's going to be a benefit to everybody else because um, now they have more, you know, you can choose from getting fruit from more places, right? You could pick the fruit if you wanted to or for free, or you could pay for uh, the nicer fruits that I'm making or something like that. But we got into that weird paradox and of how, like, maybe because the last person can't do it, then the next to the last person can't do it, and so on and so forth. I want to pick it up right there and talk about how um, Nozick wants to blunt the force of this paradox or how we can establish, yeah, there is some legitimate space for uh, ac just acquisitions. Um, Barack asks, would intellectual property rights justify things like pharmaceutical companies marking up prices for things like insulin in an exorbitant amount? We're going to talk about a case that is exactly like this that Nozick talks about at the end of the reading. So stay tuned on that. Hold, hold on to it. I think I've said that a couple times on this, but we'll definitely get to that today. Okay, so one way that we can slow down this regress of how because the last person can't take ownership of the orchard tree, uh, the fruit tree, then the next, the last person can't do it, and so on and so forth, back to the original person. Um, Nozick encourages us to say um, that... The idea of worsening someone's situation can't be a, a matter of a loss of an opportunity to improve your situation through acquisition. So if something is acquired, that maybe makes other people worse off in the sense that now they don't have the option to do that. But Nozick is encouraging us to think, nah, that's not really the, the notion of worsened that we want to have. Um, that this isn't the, the way, so if we, if we take that out of how we understand the Lockean proviso about worsening the situation of others, then the regress really slows down. Um, but the, <clears throat> that, that doesn't address everything about the concern here. And so Nozick goes a little deeper. He says, well, why would everyone else maybe want to uh, or would be okay with losing the opportunity to improve their situation via acquisition for themselves? And he goes through a laundry list here of things that uh, of how people could be benefited, how everyone else in society could be benefited by this. Let me just read you some of them. I've got some notes here. Um, it can increase the social product by giving means of production to those who can use them most efficiently. So Nozick's thinking explicitly here about something like communism, or maybe a really ham-fisted version of communism, where the means of production are owned by everybody. That might be less efficient. Um, than entrusting them to specific people who are able to manage those resources in a more efficient way for everyone else's benefit, a more robust economic system, etc. Now, this is a very contingent thing because there's no guarantee that, uh, depending on how we set up this system, if we're just using the Lockean principle about mixing labor coupled with the proviso, that may not be sufficient to ensure that the people who end up having ownership of the means of production are going to actually be the most efficient managers of it or that they're going to manage it in a way that is toward everyone else's benefit in society. But this is one thing that Nozick appeals to. He says it encourages experimentation because if you have private property about this stuff, then it's all on you. You know, you decide what to do with it. Um, if you had, if it was collectively shared ownership, then you'd have to maybe go through a bunch of committees or agree, get everyone to agree with doing something that otherwise might be risky, and there might people might be risk averse to that sort of thing. So um, that would discourage experimentation and innovation, which is something you hear a lot, right, about debates about this, um, that capitalism encourages innovation. Um, usually people are talking about this more in terms of how um, with private property and people operating in a self-interested manner that the competition is what creates the innovation. But part of it is also just being willing to take risks. Um, it's going to be easier for a person to risk the things that they have rather than risking things that everyone else has a claim to or has a stake in. Um, it also He also talks about enabling people to decide on the risks, so it promotes specialized risk bearing. So this could be like insurance companies. Um, that people can um, take on the job of managing certain types of risks rather than everyone having to be concerned about it. So it's, it's sort of like a division of labor here in the economy. Um, it, it also talks about how it protects future persons by reserving resources. So someone, if you're given ownership over the fruit trees, for example, then you're going to be encouraged to look out for yourself and your own investment in that property there and make sure that maybe you don't spend it all. 
so then all the resources are sort of saved for future generations rather than we take everything and exploit it to the full and then it's gone that kind of thing and then and this argument was a really weird one i think he says this is a direct quote uh, it provides alternate sources of employment for unpopular persons who don't have to convince any one person or small group to hire them. So there, there's something a little weird about this because it seems like, well, we got to be concerned about those assholes in society who don't get along and so people aren't going to give them opportunity or, or advantages. And so by having a system of private property about this stuff... Um, then those people are protected. <laughs> so that's, in one sense, that's a weird argument. Um, but in another sense, there could be a, a legitimate point here that if you've got, um, if you don't have this kind of private property stuff going on, then people um, where everything is sort of like community held or communally held in communism, then um, people who are, um, not as maybe well connected with others or that aren't able to play the pro-social game as well maybe have some disadvantages there so the in terms of the overall community some people could get lost in the cracks and and this is important danger to acknowledge because a communist or a socialist is really thinking about how capitalism creates that kind of effect for people that people fall through the cracks in fact there have been some uh, modern economists doing research uh, that try to advance the this position that um, capitalism actually kind of requires this that there have to be people who lose um, people who are put into disadvantaged positions and not just sort of inconvenienced but like really failing like uh, like unable to have a livelihood and that is sort of the fuel that makes the whole engine work and that capitalism actually can't work in an egalitarian sort of way. Now, those are controversial economic models, um, but there is that possible concern here in the neighborhood. And the communist is thinking, this is bad, and we want to be concerned about everyone. They've got that kind of egalitarian premise to them. But uh, Nozick's kind of making a, another point here is that um, the, a switch to communally held property may not protect everyone in in the way that it is intended to. So we have to be careful about how that happens as well. Um, this this kind of objection, I think, is one that a you know personally, I think a communist or a socialist can respect and probably should have on their radar as as a danger. Allison says, "What if someone stole a fruit from someone else's tree and grew their own tree from that fruit and profited off of that? Well, then we'd be using the justice and transfer rules, Allison. So when Nozick is saying that he has that historical perspective about how to understand justice and transfer, if you stole something, that's an illegitimate um, acquisition, or uh, that's an illegitimate transfer. The way in which you got, um, I'm, I'm going to save the word acquisition for this transition from unowned to owned. But this is a case of transfer, right? Someone owned something and then it was stolen. So that's an illegitimate transfer. So then whatever someone does with what they stole, they don't have a right to. They don't have a claim to. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If they paid for it. I mean, the key thing for Nozick is about um, whether there's consent. So they could also just ask for it. Hey, can I have some seeds? And the person's like, sure, here you go. Done. That's a just transfer. It just has to be consensual. That's the key thing. That's the key principle of justice for Nozick. Injustice and transfer. Okay, so at this point, um, Nozick, Nozick's sort of gloss on the proviso is to say that um, by acquiring a resource that is something going from unowned to being owned, I don't worsen the position of others, but by worsen, we don't mean something like worsen by limiting opportunities for appropriation by others or worsening by competition. Competition can't be seen as an affront against um, liberty. Competition itself is not the problem. Okay, but here's where uh, things get really interesting. As we remarked, most things are owned. So um, it might be that in many cases, ju uh, having the part of your economic justice theory that addresses justice and acquisition is, in most cases, sort of irrelevant that it's really all going to come down to justice and transfer. But Nozick says, and I think this is a really interesting gloss that he's putting in here, he says, all uh, cases of justice in transfer 
also need to consider themselves as morally constrained by the principles of justice and acquisition. So that he says the proviso hangs like a shadow over all transfers. So here, here's an example. Here, uh, let's go back to our, our orchard again. So let's say instead of me investing in just one of the fruit trees, I invest in all of them. And then I take ownership over all of them. Well, now everyone's situation is worsened because their option of getting the fruit without um, having to pay for it is gone. And once I'm, if society recognizes me as having property over all of the fruit trees, now I got everyone in our little community here. I got you all over a barrel because you're like, I need to eat. And I'm like, yeah, I got the food. You're going to pay? That's a monopoly. And Nozick is saying the reason why we're concerned about monopolies is because they violate this proviso in, in the meaningful way, not in just the ways that Nozick is like, yeah, we're not going to talk about worsening in terms of no, people no longer have the opportunity to acquire the fruit trees. The problem is that you don't have access to the fruit trees <laughs> and you need them, right? You need the food. Um, so that that's wrong. And I think this is always important to note. Um, no capitalist that has put together a serious theory of capitalism ever says monopolies are fine. Total free markets, no restrictions, no regulations. That actually doesn't exist unless you're an extreme anarchist or something. Um, very, very, very rare. Most defenders of capitalism are saying, yeah, we got it. We do have to have some restrictions. You got us there. You got us there. Most libertarians are going to say um, there have to be some restrictions, antitrust laws. Even when America had its like peak uh, in terms of enthusiasm about capitalism and, and total free markets, unrestricted free markets, that's always been in the mix. And now that you've seen Nozick's argument here and, and the Lockean theory about the proviso, you can maybe understand why, like what the basis of this is. Um, this is interesting, okay? So let's say instead of me just mixing my labor with all the fruit trees and then acquiring them and having this monopoly and worsening everyone's situation, um, I don't do that. Let's say it, it is this slow process where we all sort of invest in the fruit trees individually, but then because of consensual transfers, I end up acquiring all the fruit trees as property. So I create a monopoly after the fact, not initially, not through just the appropriation of all the trees um, by mixing my labor with it in the acquisition function, but through transfer. And Nozick is going to say, yeah, I don't care if it's a consensual agreement. If the consensual agreements create one of these nightmare situations where everyone else in society is put w worse off, then that's not a just transfer either. That's the way in which the proviso hangs like a shadow over all the transfers. How's this going? Is this making sense to people in chat? Yep. Cool. Okay. Uh-huh. Awesome. Okay. Now, um, I promised we would get into this stuff about intellectual property and, um, and, and especially the medicine thing. So let's say there's, um, it's already like open kind of public knowledge that there's a sort of vaccine for uh, some disease that's going around, like coronavirus. Let's say we got the, we got the vaccine for it, someone figured it out, and um, someone just goes around buying up all the vaccines and then charging exorbitant prices for it. That would not be just under Nozick's model here. Under what he's proposing, that would not be allowable. But let's say you invent the cure. So you invent the cure. Um, and then you lay claim to it with intellectual property rights, patent rights. Nozick says, in a somewhat surprising way, that you can charge whatever prices you want for that. Because you doing that doesn't worsen people's situation. Before you invented it, they didn't have the cure. After you invent it, um, for you to, to make it available in some regard is, a, is a, an improvement. Even if many people couldn't afford it or anything like that. Um, you're not taking anything away from people. Not, it's not like the orchard case where if I'm given property over all the fruit trees, now you can't eat anymore. Where before you could, and then that situation has changed. It's been worsened. Nozick says that when you invent some kind of idea or create some new thing, 
that isn't worsening anyone's situation for you to be given claim over that. Um, so there is, though, a, a way in which Nozick says the situation could become worsened. We can kind of imagine hypothetically how if I invented it and then I lay claim to it with a patent or, or some other protection for intellectual property, well, sooner or later, think of it again like the metaphor of this landscape of ideas that are being explored. So I go in there with my imagination and I find the idea. Well, that idea was there to be found. And if I didn't find it, maybe someone else would have. Okay? And the longer time goes on, the higher chance there is that someone else would have discovered it. So it would be available for somebody else to be able to offer, kind of like another fruit tree. right? So at that point, I can't lay claim to saying they can't have property ownership over this idea and do something with it. So this is the theoretical principle justification for putting expiration dates on patents and intellectual property, that they become public domain at a certain point. Um, because someone could have thought of it sooner or later. And this is true even for things like Star Wars, <laughs> I guess something like that, where, um, you know, someone would have thought of Star Wars sooner or later. You know, it's not like uh, it's so unique um, that someone couldn't, I mean, it, the ideas are out there to be found. Um, so the same thing, uh, Lock, or no, I'm sorry, Nozick talks about a, example of finding some plant in the Amazon rainforest or something that has this curing effect. Well, no one knew about it before. So when you find it, you put your labor in to discover it and then make it available. You're not worsening people's situation. But the longer time goes on, the more chances that someone else would have gone in there and been able to find it too. So then you can't have exclusive property rights to that idea anymore. And where exactly that is, eh, it's kind of fuzzy, you know, figuring out those counterfactuals is tricky, but it would justify in principle um, why we just put some kind of expiration date on these matters. Okay, so that is, um, and, and then Nozick says sort of at the, at the conclusion of the selections I gave you, that uh, he thinks free markets naturally uphold the Lockean proviso, that it, you don't have to do much regulation to make sure that they do this. And, and this was the kind of thing Mark was asking before class got started about hearing more about what, what made Nozick change his mind later in life. I think this is the key belief that he has that he then is like, mm, maybe I can't have so much optimism that free markets are going to respect um, this proviso. Um, Anthony asks, uh, how would Nozick feel about intellectual property today, the 120-year lifespan? Uh, I mean, where you actually set the bar, like I said, is, is tricky here. Um, but like to get it exactly objectively right would be tricky. I think in some ways, if we're speaking about just objectively what's going on here, it sort of depends on the idea. You know, how long would it have taken for someone else to come up with the idea is going to be different depending on what it is that's been invented. Um, sometimes inventions happen simultaneously, like people independently invent the same thing and maybe one person rushes to the patent office, office first and gets the patent on it. Um, but there have been cases where people have been able to prove in, in a court of law that they independently uh, invented this and so they have equal claim to an intellectual property right about it too. So I probably objectively it would have to be on a case-by-case -case basis if procedurally and bureaucratically we set some universal expiration date on things that that could be justified just for pragmatic reasons 120 years seems a little long I think especially given um, how inventions and technology are sort of accelerating in their rate by which they happen so maybe we'd want to accommodate that um, but I, I might throw the question at you Anthony um, what do you think <laughs> I mean, the, we're just kind of talking about the applications of Nozick's theory rather than um, the, the details of a particular proposal here. Um, do you think the, the sorts of moral variables that Nozick has on the radar adequately account for whatever decision-making we do about intellectual property here? While you're doing that, I'm going to do something for us. 
terms of art, it seems ridiculous, such as Mickey Mouse, which is still protected. Yeah, let's not talk about, <laughs> about Disney, or we talk about Disney. Um, <laughs> I think Disney's stranglehold on intellectual property is kind of absurd um, in the way that they're doing it. I mean, that's really... Um, I mean, monopolies can exist everywhere, right? And and when when does something get to the level of a monopoly? I, uh, Nozick gives us at least a theoretical principle for figuring this out. When the situation of others in society is put it is worsened to a significant degree, then we've got an issue here. Um, let's do. Um, All right, so I like the suggestion. Can everyone see this? Oh, my camera is mirrored. Ha! <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna put this on YouTube, huh? <laughs> yeah, they're gonna copyright strike me. Everyone can see this? We're gonna try out this experiment. Okay. All right, there you go. <laughs> um, for those of you watching this on YouTube later, I know it's mirrored, but I think you can figure out what's going on here. I'm not going to try to... Well, I can't, well maybe I could... Well, nah. Can I do this easily, this app? If this is Photoshop, I'd have no problem. <sighs> okay, I think you can figure it out. Uh, if this just totally blows up, my apologies as an experiment. Um, but give it a try. We'll see how this goes. All right, um, so... Allison says, same with how, like, basically every melody in music is copyrighted, but I think there's a fine line. I mean, when it comes to copyrights in music, there's a lot of leeway that courts have given um, for allowing things to be, like, not copyright infringement when it comes to music. But really, I, I think so much of copyright law is not about the theory like the things that are going on right now that we could be concerned about is the way in which the law gets skewed to protect certain business interests instead of having a fair system that is responsive to the moral parameters of what's relevant here. And, that, and that's why in a, in a lot of cases with uh, political philosophy, you know, this isn't the whole story. Um, there, there's a lot of uh, injustice that is just dumb. That's how I put it, dumb injustice. There's just no argument to defend this sort of thing. Um, this kind of special interest catering or um, abuse of the systems um, that are designed to justify certain principles of social justice, and those should be resisted. They should be criticized, they should be resisted, but it's not the kind of thing you get a rational controversy about. Like writing a paper about it is like, it's kind of a straightforward paint by numbers sort of thing. Here's the principle, this is violating it, it's wrong, the end. <laughs> it's not so much. The hardest thing is just how do you get people to change about it? And that's a practical issue rather than a theoretical one. Um, where there can be theoretical implications to how to go about advocacy. There's a philosophy of advocacy that definitely happens too, or a philosophy of activism. Um, but th those are different types of debates. And the main thing that we need first is just what are the proper measuring sticks that for which we could identify abuse. Um, or what counts as right and wrong in these cases. And Nozick is offering us a theory for that. Um, oh, you don't have to worry about spelling. Yeah, 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 exactly. That's right. Okay, so, so much for Nozick. I did want to get to Rawls today. We only have nine minutes left, uh, ten minutes. I'm going to go for it. So, um, in getting into Rawls, it's really this, we're playing the same game here as we're playing with Nozick in the sense of what question are we asking and trying to answer. And, uh, I set up uh, Nozick the other day with saying um, society is a massive system of cooperation and we have institutional rules for figuring out how that organization ought to happen. And as Mill said in On Liberty, that can happen through legal conventions, through the government. It can also happen through social conventions. Either way, there's going to be some rules here for how people are expected to behave and what are the repercussions when they don't. Um, and what sort of spaces of freedom and liberty people are given and which ones do they not have freedom and liberty to engage in. There's sort of the space of what, your, uh, what is permissible um, under principles of social justice and what's impermissible and what you have obligations not to do. 
and carving that up is is the question at hand and kind of similar to how uh, Nozick was, was sort of criticizing distributive justice um, but he is still advocating for some sort of system about how to handle property and resources in society in a just way that's what Rawls is trying to get at too and I'm gonna I'm gonna go a little bit further here um, I think I, I briefly mentioned this idea but I want to I want to get it get it in in a little bit more robust way because it's much more uh, conceptually relevant for what Rawls is up to think about any system of cooperation and a good example here might be small group work <laughs> when you have to do like small group projects for school um, there's going to be special burdens and also special benefits of having that cooperation so think about the benefits you got a project it's a group project so now you got more people to contribute to division of labor so and, and you maybe have more ideas more more room for innovation um, for correcting mistakes these are all benefits of doing the project together rather than just doing it all by yourself right so there's some unique there people are people have what they can contribute as individuals but when they pool their resources together or coordinate their efforts together there's some unique advantages that emerge in that framework but as anyone who has done a group project knows there are also unique burdens and sometimes these benefits and burdens are not or we could have concerns about them being justly distributed okay so the burdens of cooperation one big one is organization um, and coordinating everyone to get on the same page that takes effort that takes work um, people in chat does this sound familiar this this uh, illustration ringing some bells in your personal experience I'm anticipating that it will yeah hundred percent Angela says yeah classic yes yeah mm-hmm mm -hmm. so um, how are we going to distribute those benefits and burdens of social cooperation that's the question of uh, economic justice in many ways and and a lot of stuff about social justice uh, this covers a huge swath of the territory um, like we've talked about before politics is really just about social justice and there's no way to talk about that without getting into economic issues um, how resources are functioning um, in a society is a major major component of the social cooperation that's that's taking place it's not everything I don't know if everything can be reduced to just the economic dimension um, but it certainly is a universally ubiquitous component to it and that's why we're, what we're talking about here it Rawls has ambitions to go even bigger than just economic issues though I mean he wants to talk about social justice in total um, but a lot of what is the controversial part of Rawls's proposal has to do with resources and the concerns about resources is also a sort of prompted him to come up with this theory in the first place it's part of the inspiration for it um, but think about that the problem is being sort of framed that way if we work together then there's going to be special benefits and there are going to be special burdens and when we're thinking about distributive justice we're not just thinking about what people own but how to manage those aspects so here's some other important premises that um, that uh, Rawls is working with as a social liberal so you uh, kind of the two classic positions here on social justice are libertarians who prioritize freedom and liberty this is what Nozick is doing even if it doesn't always maximize utility or create good consequences for everybody certainly Nozick system is more available for people to fall through the cracks and and have bad things done to them there is the proviso about worsening the situation of others but it's not giving any kind of mandate here for positively promoting people's quality of life or well-being or something like that so the libertarian does care about well-being but it is deprioritized above uh, liberty and the social liberal flips those around they care about liberty too but they're really concerned about well-being this is this is how the debate usually kind of gets framed this is a big really big picture like zoomed out right this is but this is where a lot of the controversy happens sometimes um, say Nozick is criticizing the distributive patterns the patterned notions of distributive justice that social liberals use um, and, and, and some Nozick doesn't say this exactly but you hear this kind of criticism all the time people aren't equal and to try to treat people as if they are equal in society is just wrong it's just not accurate to how things are but for someone like Rawls 
um, this isn't what he's trying to say. Um, it's not, uh, he, he acknowledges that people are not in equal positions sort of in nature or something. Like, um, apart from their role in society, not everyone has got the same stuff going on, right? Everyone's in a different position. But um, while the, the sort of, we can't maybe make reality equal across the board, we can ask for whether there's an equitable way of handling the unique benefits and burdens of social cooperation. That's what rules of, like social rules, whether that's in the government or, in, or just in a culture, can, has the ability to regulate. So you can't control variables that you don't have control over. But as soon as we have a system of cooperation, what's a just way for that system of cooperation to work depends on deciding about how these special extra bonuses um, get handled. Okay, so uh, as you also probably know, when you're doing small group work, not everyone has the same skills that they're bringing to the table. Some people maybe are able to contribute more, um, and some people are able to contribute less, or contribute different things. That can happen too. So what are you what are you going to do about that? How's the grading going to work? You know, that's the benefit to be distributed, perhaps. That's one of them in that context. Um, and how should the burdens be distributed? That's a major question. And Nozick's talked about some ways of patterning that. Rawls is also going to be proposing a pattern. But before we get to his pattern, we need to think about what informs how he gets there. Because one of the core things that uh, Rawls is um, standing for theoretically is he thinks justice is determined by a process. And it's not about a product. So even though he's kind of a classic example of the sorts of positions that Nozick is trying to criticize, he isn't doing the straight-up thing that Nozick accused his opponents of doing, which is having the end state or product model of distributive justice, of this patterned distributive justice. He's really interested in the process by which we determine what is socially just and what's socially unjust when it comes to the distribution of these benefits and burdens. Okay, So um, when we're thinking about the principles of justice for social justice, it's not like society is getting its moral fingers into every aspect of people's lives. What we're thinking about is what it has mandate for is managing the space of cooperation. The, the extra things that are added once we are not working just under our own power, but when we're working together. And, and part of the setup here is also recognizing that at this point you kind of don't have a choice. Uh, participating in society is kind of unavoidable. There's no way to deal with that. But we can still imagine what might be going on prior to having a system in place. This is kind of going back to ideas of the state of nature. Um, Rawls is going to have his own version of a state of nature like Hobbes was talking about and that Locke was talking about. Um, there's going to be a, a twist on that pattern. Uh, but it's one that Rawls is not interested in thinking about in terms of us not existing in any society whatsoever or that it was something that actually historically happened. It's going to be purely theoretical. But it's still, if you're, if you're kind of been paying attention this whole quarter, you know that these ideas of states of nature are very much connected with anyone trying to do a social contract project, which is what Hobbes and Locke are both doing. And that's the same thing Rawls is going to be doing too. He's going to be trying to look at, like, not an actual contract, but what would be a reasonable contract that we could prescribe as giving guidance for how we ought to behave. Like we should act as if we had made a certain type of contract. And the main reason for this, for uh, Rawls thinks about it, I, I think of Rawls, just personally, I think Rawls is like the, the cutting edge evolution of social contract theories, for better or for worse, for everything that they're capable of, and maybe showing the limits of what they're not capable of, too. Um, but this is sort of the premier, this is like the best version of this type of thinking. That's my kind of opinion about it, um, but what reason to maybe take Rawls as a serious object of study. Uh, think about this whole tradition, this intellectual tradition of social contract theories. Um, so uh, I'll leave you with one thing before we have to, because I know we have to close up for today. Um, the main motivator, as I'm going to present Rawls tomorrow as, as having for his whole project, is he's worried about bias, and he's worried about power and the biasing effect of power, both having it and not having it. That basically your view of social justice is going to be largely informed by just what is in your self-interest. 
and he wants to deal with that. He thinks that's not going to create a fair understanding of either what a just society looks like theoretically or what we actually put into practice in the real world. So he's looking for, he, he's really worried about the ubiquity of bias here and what can we do about it? How can we come up with a conception of social justice that isn't question begging, that isn't coming from a, a, a biased position? So that is part of the really big project and ambition that Rawls has. So we'll talk more about that tomorrow. Um, I, will, I will let you go. I know it's time to move on to the next class. Um, hope this went good. And I'm looking forward to talking more about Rawls with you tomorrow. So I'll see you then. You're welcome.